Hello everyone, I am the Bennett Kirby, and welcome to my channel, The Commander Tavern. The Commander Tavern is a channel dedicated to my favorite Magic the Gathering format. The Brewery is a series on this channel showcasing my spicy brews and other deck text. On this episode of The Brewery, I'll be discussing my take on a commander from Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, Tameshi Reality Architect. If you like this deck or any of the cards I'll be mentioning throughout the video, please consider using my TCG Player affiliate link when purchasing those cards. You can find that link down in the description. It'll really help out the channel. The best way you can help support the channel is my Patreon. For just $1, patrons get early access to certain videos on YouTube. In fact, patrons got a chance to see this video earlier. You can also support my channel for free by simply liking, subscribing, and sharing, which also helps out a lot. You can join my Discord server for free if you want to join the Commander Tavern community. All pertinent links are down in the description. Alright, let's get back to the episode. Tameshi is a 2-3 Moon Folk Wizard for 2 generic and 1 blue. However, having an activated ability requiring white makes her color identity both white and blue. Said activated ability allows you to reanimate any artifact and enchantment in your graveyard for just 1 white and X, where X is its mana value. You can also bounce a land as part of its cost. In this way, Tameshi is definitely a callback to all those Moon Folk Wizards from the original Kamigawa block, where you bounce lands as part of the activation cost of some ability. However, Tameshi also has a great triggered ability that happens whenever one or more non-creature permanents are returned to hand, drawing you a card when it does. While this only triggers once per turn, if you bounce a land during your turn with her ability, you draw a card. Then if you bounce a non-creature permanent of an opponent's during each of their turn, you can potentially draw a card per turn which can definitely add up. So the once per turn clause isn't so bad. Bouncing a land to your hand might also inspire you to build a landfall package for Tameshi. While that was one of my first thoughts, there were enough impactful landfall cards that really inspired me. However, reanimating artifacts and enchantments, that certainly did. And while that was a strong theme in my Goshin Tai deck, which I released a video for a couple of weeks ago, I built Goshin Tai around shrines and sagas. But I mentioned being able to build a really evil deck centered around stacks and reanimating evil cards like Stasis and Decree of Silence, which I didn't do. That being said, that's exactly what I wound up doing with Tameshi. The stacks pieces of the deck aren't necessarily to be super annoying for the entirety of the duration of the match. It's to slow down other players, particularly faster decks like those with green, as well as to protect other combo players from winning since our main route to victory is combo. Notwithstanding, this deck does have a couple of alternate wins, not 100% depending on comboing off, just in case. But I'll show the deck's main combos near the end of the video once I finish explaining most of the cards that make up its main engines. So for those of you who absolutely hate stacks even though it's a viable strategy, avert your eyes and go watch this video instead. Tameshi could be built similarly to Emery Lurker of the Lock. So if you want a nice reanimator deck that focuses around artifacts, you can get some ideas there. Or you could also watch my Goshin Tai video if you haven't seen that one yet. It's an enchantment reanimator deck that's way more casual than this one. Alright, with those warnings out of the way, for those brave but sick souls who love sucking out your opponent's will to live, keep on watching. For the rest of you, your discretion is advised. Rhystic Study, Mystic Remora, and Esper Sentinel are included in order to not just tax opponent's spells, but to draw cards off of them. Of these, Rhystic Study is the more lackluster one because it doesn't interact with anything else in the deck besides being a ubiquitous stacks piece. However, the Remora really shines here. It has a built-in sacrifice trigger thanks to its cumulative upkeep, so we can choose not to pay it so that it gets sacrificed. We can then reanimate it with Tameshi, bouncing a land to our hand or just paying 2 mana. Why might this be useful? Well, we might want to draw a card off of Tameshi, but not have anything in our graveyard to reanimate. Plus, there are some spicy lands in the deck that we might want to reuse multiple times. The Sentinel is also an artifact, so we can reanimate it with Tameshi in a pinch. Not only that, but we can also tutor for it if need be. But we'll see some more of that soon enough. Grand Arbiter Augustine IV is another tax effect that brings about no other benefit to us than by reducing the cost of our colored spells by 1, 2 if it's multicolored. This guy is absolutely hated, so do keep that in mind depending on your pod. However, he does slow down combo decks immensely, so he's a beast here. Plus, he helps speed up our own game. Lavinia Azorius Renegade also slows down decks by altogether preventing them from casting certain spells. I find Lavinia to be a bit meaner than Grand Arbiter Augustine IV, though. Augustine just makes their spells cost one generic more. And against green decks, that's mainly Acceleration via land-based ramp, she doesn't do much. But every other deck that accelerates their mana via mana rocks and mana dorks won't be able to cast big and splashy spells unless they actually control that many lands. Dranath Magistrate is another way to prevent spells from being cast altogether. Yes, it can hurt commanders without eminence if they haven't been cast yet, but at the same time, decks should still be able to be somewhat functional without their commander. That being said, it's still great against Voltron decks if the commander is stuck in the command zone. That's a decent enough floor. But Dranath Magistrate also helps prevent players cast things from exile and their graveyard. 
There's plenty of impulsive draw in the format as well as ways to cast spells from the graveyard. This card helps shut down too many strategies to not include. Grand Abolisher and Tidal Barracuda help prevent spells from being cast but only during our turn. As I mentioned earlier, this deck aims to slow and shut down everything while we're simultaneously assembling our game ending engine. Not having to worry about other control players interacting with us during our turn is great. The Barracuda also gives other players the opportunity to interact with each other outside of their own turn, and obviously ours. So it also gives our opponents opportunity windows against each other. Hope of Girapur is another way to stop opponents from playing, but it can only affect one opponent and prevents them from casting non-creature spells. So feel free to try and hit the non-green player or the player who you know will want to try and win via comboing off. Another great thing about this legendary Thopter is that it's super cheap to reanimate with Tameshi, so it also allows for the same hijinxes as Mystic Remora. Soul Guide Lantern is another stacks effects, although slightly more niche. It destroys graveyard decks and you can keep reanimating it for super cheap to keep exiling that opponent's graveyard or maybe multiple graveyards if need be. Then if they're no longer a threat, or maybe you weren't facing graveyard decks to begin with, you can simply use it as a recurrable card draw. Even Mind Sensor is slightly less niche, but at the absolute least it will prevent players from being able to ramp or use their fetch lands. At best, it can prevent opponents from tutoring for any responses to your hate fueled board state. However, now we go to the true boogeyman of the deck, the two cards that inspired this build, the Cree of Silence and Stasis. In a multiplayer game of Commander, it might be easier for your opponents to band together and cast their cheapest spells in order to get rid of the Decree as swiftly as possible. However, it still remains that they're losing 3 spells to do so. And even then, you can just reanimate it with Tameshi. Yes, it'll cost 9 mana to do so, but this deck is actually quite surprising in its land-based ramp, which we'll soon see. As a bonus, you can also cycle Decree of Silence in order to counter target spell. It's a bit steep at 6 mana to do so, but at least you can do that in a pinch and then reanimate it later on. As for Stasis, it's one of those cards that you have to absolutely make sure your playgroup won't mind playing against. Hell, some masochists even enjoy playing against it. But this card is absolutely evil, especially when played around. Unfortunately, Stasis' built-in sacrifice effect is after your untapped step, so you can't abuse it along the same vein as Mystic Remora. That being said, the deck has ways around that like Phantatog. Just sacrifice Stasis to it at the beginning of the end step before yours. That way you get your untapped step and can then reanimate it with Tameshi for just 3 mana. Super evil. As a bonus, it also serves as a free instant speed discard outlet. Solitary Confinement is another enchantment with a built-in sacrifice trigger that we can continuously abuse with Tameshi. We can use it as consequential discard outlet, but we, if we don't or can't discard a card, it has to be sacrificed. No worries, that's what Tameshi is for. The benefit of keeping it around, we have Shroud and can't have any damage dealt to us. While not a stacks effect, this card is very annoying to play against, especially when you can continuously reanimate it. In fact, since it also has the downside of having you skip your draw step, you can let it be sacrificed during your upkeep, draw a card during your draw step, and then reanimate it in your main phase. So good. Alright, so if you thought that just because we saw all the deck's stacks effects we're done being annoying, you're so wrong. The deck has plenty more interactive effects as well as other protective effects beyond solitary confinement. Seal of Cleansing, Seal of Removal, and Soul Snare are some more enchantments that can be self-sacrificed for value. Not only are these enchantments good on their own because it's essentially a no trespassing sign for your opponents, but they're recurrable with Tameshi. Your opponents can't complain if you use any of these against them if done in response to their transgressions. And we're just getting started with the bouncing effects with Seal of Removal. The deck's also running Hallbreaker Horror and Hydar Rhyme Wind Master. While the horror is quite bulky to cast, as I mentioned earlier, you'd be surprised how amazingly this deck is able to get tons of lands onto the battlefield. In any case, when you do have it in play, then any spell you cast has a bounce effect stapled onto it. It can't bounce lands, but that doesn't really matter. It can also deal with uncounterable spells since it returns them to its caster's hand. Hydar is the sole reason why all the deck's basics are snow, and that's to be able to pay 2 and tap him in order to bounce any permanent to its owner's hand. We can also do this at instant speed, which is amazing. Naturally, Cyclonic Rift is the best way to bounce your opponent's boards, excluding their lands. Overloading this is quite harrowing, especially if we're able to do this time after time. Thanks to Mystic Sanctuary, we can top deck any instant or sorcery from our graveyard. We do have to control three other islands when it enters the battlefield, but that won't be an issue here. We can also do it at instant speed since it's fetchable. In any case, we can overload Cyclonic Rift, play Mystic Sanctuary untapped, and then top deck Cyclonic Rift. Oh, and would you look at that, if we activate Tameshi to reanimate any artifact or enchantment, we'll have Mystic Sanctuary in our hand to do it all over again. So this is quite the oppressive soft lock. Maybe not along the same vein as Stasis since it requires a bit of mana to do, but it's still incredibly oppressive nonetheless. 
However, this isn't the only tricks we can do with Mystic Sanctuary, but we'll see those in a bit. Spell Sky is another way to annoy opponents since we can change the target of their spells or effects. It helps our other permanents against spot removal, but we can also essentially quote unquote steal their aura spells and equipment. They'll still control the aura, but any beneficial aura will be enchanting Spell Sky. We can also make them have to outrace us in mana in order to equip any equipment onto their creature, since we can either pay 1 blue mana or 2 life in order for that equipment to equip Spell Sky instead. Super busted. Best of all, it's an artifact. So it does have to redirect a kill spell to itself, we can reanimate it later with Tameshi and get a key land back into our hand for our trouble too. Azoria's Guild Mage also messes with our opponent's abilities. Activated abilities to be exact. While all players understand that control players can essentially counter almost anything they cast, players tend to forget that it's possible to counter triggered and activated abilities. This does just that. Since it doesn't require a tapping, we can counter as many of them as we're able to. Boy do players get salty when they're going to ultimate their planeswalker forgetting that you're controlling Azorius Guild Mage. Speaking of building a control player, Pact of Negation, Swan Song, Negate, Counterspell, and Mana Drain are obviously included. While small, this is a decent enough counterspell suite to prevent an opponent from comboing off as well as protecting our own combo when it comes to it. Sometimes opponents will gang up on you for playing stacks, so you need some good old fashioned generic counterspells too. Lightning Greaves and Swiftfoot Boots are some more generic cards in the deck and these are some of the best to include. They're essentially for protecting Tameshi, which is one of the main engine pieces of the deck, but can also be used to protect any other key creature that needs protecting. Going back to the synergistic interaction of the deck, you can't go wrong with Orowara, Soaring City, and a Ganjo Seed of the Empire. These lands are absolutely busted here since they definitely do not take up a slot in the deck. Best of all, even if you had to initially play them as lands to not miss your land drop, you can get them back with Tameshi when reanimating an artifact or enchantment. Otawara further synergizes with the deck since it's a bouncing a card, triggering Tameshi's card draw effect, assuming it's the first time you triggered it that turn. A Ganjo isn't bad either since it can be used to give quite the slap to an attacker or blocker. Crucible of Worlds is included to make further use of these lands. You can channel them and then play them as lands from your graveyard, then bounce them with Tameshi in order to have them ready to channel again if needed. Super busted. The Crucible also works well in the deck apart from them since it can help us reuse our fetch lands each turn and not miss our land drop. So good. Speaking of land drops each turn, Royal Elemental is another amazing interactive piece in the deck. It's a bit hefty and uncomfortable to cast, but we'll see in a bit why that isn't an issue here. In any case, playing a land per turn, or possibly multiple lands per turn, means being able to steal multiple creatures around the board. Depending on the types of decks you're fighting against, when used as a piece in one of the deck's engines, we can steal all the creatures and then just continuously swing into our opponents with them and win that way. This makes Royal Elemental one of those alternate routes to victory that I mentioned earlier. While white and blue doesn't excel in land-based ramp like green does, Tameshi can make do by recurring cards like Burnished Heart and Wayfarer's Bauble. Sure, Burnished Heart costs 3 to cast once and then 3 to sacrifice, but you get 2 basic lands. You do have to spend 4 to reanimate it and then 3 more to get 2 more basic lands, but keep in mind that while that might seem slow, we're already slowing down the rest of the table with our stacks effects, so it evens out in terms of relative speed. Wayfarer's Bauble costs 1 to cast and 2 to activate to only get 1 land and then 2 to reanimate with Tameshi, which also seems fair since it's half of the cost of Burnished Heart for half of the lands. That being said, it's cheap to self-sacrifice and cheap to cast so we can also use it to help fuel Tameshi bouncing lands if we need to. Archaeomancer's map, Expedition map, and Wayward Wayfarer also provide land-based mana acceleration, but only halfway there since the lands go to our hand and not the battlefield. That being said, they still help us in not missing a land drop. Of these, Expedition Map is the only one that does not care about the number of lands opponents control. The others do, but that's just because they're white and white's all about balance. That being said, Archaeomancer's Map is still good at getting lands from our hand onto the battlefield whenever an opponent with more lands than us plays a land. Weathered Wayfarer is also along that same vein, but at least it can get us any land into our hand like Expedition Map can. So we can get Mystic Sanctuary, Otawara, or a Ganjo, which is amazing. Patron of the Moon and Walking Atlas don't necessarily ramp us, but when used in conjunction with the previously mentioned effects, they do. The Patron is just amazing since we can drop two lands from our hand for just one generic. It might be a bit costly to cast, but it does have Moonfolk offering, if you're feeling brave and want to sacrifice Tameshi for it to make it cost three less to cast. But I wouldn't do that. Walking Atlas is great because the land doesn't enter that. Not only that, but it combos amazingly with Retreat to Kohlhelm. Whenever a land enters a battlefield under our control, possibly with Walking Alice's ability, we can then untap it and then tap it again to put any other lands from our hand onto the battlefield. These two cards are actually part of a couple of infinite recursion engines that we'll see near the end of the video. 
Quark Clan Ironworks can give us bursts of colorless mana at the cost of sacrificing an artifact. However, that's not really an issue with Tameshi, since we can simply reanimate the artifact later on if need be. However, KCI can help us potentially go infinite, which we'll soon see. Lotus Bloom is one way to get fast mana quickly by being a Black Lotus with Suspend. However, once it's in our graveyard, it only costs one white to reanimate with Tameshi. So if you've been keeping track by now, you can already start to see some of these pieces combined to go infinite. Mox Amber, Mox Opal, Soul Ring, and Arcane Signet are the deck's actual mana rocks. The first two being the most important ones, not just because they're fast due to being zero costed, but because being zero costed allows for some epic combo potential. You can also take out Arcane Signet for Mana Crypt if you want another zero costed mana rock for these engines. That being said, even on their own, they're so useful as ubiquitous mana rocks. Dark Seal Citadel, Ancient Den, Seed of the Synod, and Razor Tide Bridge are also essentially zero costed mana rocks that take up land slots in the deck while also taking up a land drop to play. That being said, since they're artifacts without a casting cost, Tameshi only needs one white mana and bouncing a land to get any of these back onto the battlefield from the graveyard, and are thus also key pieces to multiple recursion engines in the deck, especially if we have Royal Elemental out. Master Transmuter, while not a mana acceleration piece in the strictest sense, is essentially cheating in a more expensive artifact while bouncing back a cheaper one. If we're bouncing back a zero-costed artifact, then we're essentially casting that more expensive artifact for just one blue mana. Actually, it's even better than casting since getting cheated onto the battlefield means it can't be countered by an opponent. Well, even then, that doesn't matter since we can always just reanimate any artifact that's in the graveyard due to an opponent countering it anyways. Now, all these things are fine and dandy, but surely Tameshi's trigger isn't the only way this deck is drawing cards. It is blue after all, and we need to dig through our deck for responses, stacks effects, and engine pieces. Fear not, the deck can still do so flavorfully and synergistically thanks to Baron Talarian Archmage and Seagate Restoration. While Baron only triggers during our turn, it's still a free card draw effect and at the end of the turn, which is actually an amazing bonus that becomes key for helping make an infinite combo much better. Another great bonus is Baron bouncing another creature or planeswalker when entering the battlefield. Seagate Restoration is a pretty sweet card draw spell when we have a handful of lands since we draw cards equal to the number of cards in our hand plus one. We also get a pseudo emblem where we have no maximum hand size for the remainder of the game. But other than that, it doesn't take up a slot in the deck since its backside is a land with the potential of entering the battlefield untapped and generating blue mana. Thanks to Tameshi, if we had to use this early game as a land, we can then bounce it with her and cast it as Seagate Restoration to draw into a ton of lands later on in the match. After you draw your cards, you can then replay it as a land from your graveyard with Crucible of Worlds if you're in the mood for drawing more cards. Like I said, Crucible of Worlds is amazing in this deck. Shorikai Genesis Engine, Sky Swimmer Koi, and Memory Jar can also help us draw cards while also discarding cards. While Tameshi doesn't cheat any cost when reanimating artifacts or enchantments, discarding them might seem like more work. However, we can draw into a ton of cards with these three cards. Without the absolute downside of having to discard away any cards precisely because we can recur them later on. Shorikai, while not being crewed anytime soon, can have us draw two cards and discard one while also creating a potential chump blocker for just one mana and tapping. If we collect enough pilots, then we can crew Shorikai if we wanted to. The Koi is stupid good since it doesn't tap, it has a triggered ability. Whenever an artifact enters the battlefield, we can choose to loot if we wanted to. If we need to draw cards, we can discard away a land, we can later replay with Crucible of Worlds, or an artifact or enchantment we can later recover with Tameshi. It's also a 3-3 with flying for just 4 mana. I have no idea how this is a common instead of an uncommon. Memory Jar is possibly the most busted of these though, since we're essentially wheeling for just 5 mana, tapping it and sacrificing it. Granted, all of our opponents do so as well. But if we had Grand Abolisher or Tidal Barracuda in play, they can't play what they drew during our turn. So we can use this to dig super deep through our deck if we have the mana to pull it off, because we can pay 6 to reanimate it with Tameshi whenever we wanted to. Commander's Insight, Drown in Dreams, and Stroke of Genius lets us straight up draw X cards at instant speed. While these might seem like ubiquitous includes in a blue deck, we can actually realistically draw into a ton of cards thanks to all of the lands we're quickly accumulating during a game. However, as some of you might have noticed by now, we can also generate infinite mana. When you do, these spells say target player draws X cards, so we can use these on an opponent to deck them, but we'll see that in a bit. Don't worry, we'll get to those combos soon. I want to first go over all of the pieces since they do work on their own, and then I'll go over the combos in great detail. Thought Vessel and Reliquary Tower are included due to the sheer amount of cards we'll be drawing, plus the fact that we'll be bouncing lands to our hand, so we do want to keep those cards as well as any interaction we have in there. 
Being a stacks deck means being arch enemy from the get-go, so we need to have all of our answers. Enlightened Tutor, Mystical Tutor, and Merchant Scroll bypass drawing altogether by getting straight to the point and tutoring for the card we need when we need it. Even though the first two top deck it from our library, they still do it at instant speed so we can cast them in response to drawing a card. Merchant Scroll gets it to our hand but it's limited to a blue instant and can only be cast at sorcery speed while also costing 2. That being said, it's still an amazing tutor here regardless if Hold Lance holds a special place in my heart or not. Oswald Fiddlebender is another tutor in the deck since he's basically a birthing pod for artifacts on a body. This effect is super strong here since we can risk sacrificing a key artifact because we can always just reanimate it later on with Tameshi. Oswald can turn those zero costed mana rocks and artifact lands into expedition map to then start recurring that to never miss a land drop or a wayfarer's bauble to actually ramp, or get soul guide lantern, or get esper sentinel. He can then change that into walking atlas, lightning greaves, or any other key to drop which can then be changed into Crucible of Worlds, Burnished Heart, or any other 3-drop that can be changed into Shorikai or KCI. You get the point. You can also use Oswald to get Codex Shredder or Scrap Trawler for some more recursive effects. We can't always just depend on Tameshi. Each time we sacrifice an artifact, Scrap Trawler triggers returning a cheaper one from our graveyard to our hand. Not only is this busted with Oswald, but with the deck's self-sacrificing artifacts, like Codex Shredder. While 5 generic might seem like a steep cost, it only costs 1 to cast meaning that it costs 2 to reanimate with Tameshi. In fact, Codex Shredder is a key component to one of the deck's winning combos. And with that, we segue to the combo explanations. As I've been mentioning all this time, the deck aims to slow the entire table almost to a halt so that it can combo off and then immediately win that way. Preferably, of course. One way of doing that is by also guaranteeing to be able to do it via infinite turns. The deck is running Nexus of Fate and Temporal Manipulation, which I'd like to say work well on their own, but no one really runs extra turn spells unless they're able to abuse them in decks that take infinite turns or are constantly taking an extra turn. That's why this deck really only needs these two, and that's because they both behave differently. These are also chosen because they're extra turns for you and not target player, meaning that an opponent can't steal them from the stack or redirect their target. Either way, we only need two since we can tutor for them anyways. Alright, let's start with the easiest one to cast infinitely many times, Temporal Manipulation. Assuming we already have Codex Shredder and Tameshi in play with Temporal Manipulation in our hand, while also having access to enough mana to pay for all the costs involved. We cast Temporal Manipulation taking an extra turn. We then activate Codex Shredder, returning Temporal Manipulation to our hand. We then activate Tameshi, returning Codex Shredder to play. We then start that extra turn, play the land with Bound with, with Tameshi, and start all over again. Another setup for infinite turns is a bit clunkier but still achievable. Assuming we have Mystic Sanctuary, Lotus Bloom, and Tameshi on the battlefield, plus Merchant Scroll in our hand. We crack Lotus Bloom for triple blue. We then use two of that blue mana to cast Merchant Scroll, tutoring for Nexus of Fate to our hand. We then activate Tameshi to reanimate Lotus Bloom and bouncing Mystic Sanctuary to our hand. Crack Lotus Bloom once more for triple blue. Use the four blue in our mana pool and three more mana to cast Nexus of Fate. Then play Mystic Sanctuary from your hand to top deck Merchant Scroll. You'll draw into it during your extra turn. And then you do this all over again. This can also be achieved with Mystical Tutor instead of Merchant Scroll. Since the tutor top decks Nexus of Fate, you can draw into it with Tameshi's Triggered Ability when you activate her to reanimate Lotus Bloom. So it'll still have the same outcome. With infinite turns and stacks, you're already going to annoy your opponents to the point of them conceding and scooping to start a new game. While that in and of itself is a victory since you can just use your infinite turns to attack your opponents enough times to kill them, assuming their board is clear thanks to an overloaded Cyclonic Rift, or because you stole all of your things with Roll Elemental, or because your Kappa Cannoneer became so large due to all the artifacts entering the battlefield that you can take out an opponent, unopposed since it also becomes unblockable too. This is yet another way to end the game relatively quickly, but because once you're going infinite you can also then eventually assemble your infinite mana combo. Or maybe you assembled this first and then drew into a draw X spell. So let's see how the deck generates infinite mana. Assuming you have Lotus Bloom, Walking Atlas, Retreat to Coral Helm, and Tameshi in play. Crack Lotus Bloom for 3 mana of any color you want. Then activate Tameshi to reanimate Lotus Bloom, bouncing any white generating land that doesn't enter the battlefield tapped. Activate Walking Atlas, putting that land back onto the battlefield. This triggers Retreat to Coral Helm, untapping Walking Atlas. Rinse and repeat for infinite mana of all colors if you wanted to. You can then sync this mana into any of the X draw spells. You can also win the same turn if you had Codex Shredder to recover that X draw spell. You can also generate infinite mana with KCI and any zero-costed mana rock that can tap for white like let's say Mox Opal. 
just tap the obo for white mana, sacrifice it to KCI for 2 generic, and then reanimate it with Tameshi. This generates infinite colorless mana. Then when you reanimate it that final time, tap it for blue to cast that stroke of genius for the win. The rest of the deck is just the rest of the lands. The deck's running all 7 fetch lands, hollowed fountain, prairie stream, glacial floodplain, irrigated farmland, mystic gate, glacial fortress, deserted beach, command tower, and ancient tomb, as well as 5 of each basic snow lands, as previously mentioned, in order to make the most out of Hydar Rhyme Wind Master. However, as for the amount of basic lands per se, is due to all the recurrable effects that ramp for basic lands. So this is a good critical mass of basics for these effects. This brew is just an idea of Haldebaran Tameshi Reality Architect. Congratulations if you made it this far considering how evil this deck can be. However, even then, this deck is not as evil as it can be. Tameshi has some serious CDH potential. While this build can be too powerful for more casual pods, it's too weak in CDH level pods. So the best power level to play this in is that high powered range that's just below CADH. If you're interested in the decklist of this spicy brew of mine, you can find a link to it down in the description. I would like to thank all my patrons for supporting me and a quick shout out to all my higher tier patrons, the brewers, for their patronage. I'd also like to thank anyone using my TCG Player affiliate link, that also helps out the channel. And to everyone, thanks for watching this episode of The Brewery on the Commander Tavern. I am the Bennett Kirby, and happy brewing!